and I did not create a constructor for it. If we look, no constructor. All right. But as is stated previously, if you don't create a, you know, if you don't create a constructor, the compiler generates a no argument constructor that simply creates objects and doesn't do any initializing. All right. So that's what happens. So we, when we create this object in our code here, where we create our new meal, we don't get a compile error, right? Because the constructor was supplied by us, or, or to us rather, by the compiler. So the question I want to start class with today is, what constructors should we have? All right, and there's no right or wrong answer to this. Uh, there might be some wrong answers, I don't know. If you, if you work hard enough, you could come up with some really wrong answers. But uh, there's no definitive answer, let's put it that way. I'm more like, I want to hear the thought process that you have. And the question was to repeat, we had no constructors, a, a, a no argument constructor was created for us. What constructors should we have? If you were doing this, what constructors would you put on, on this? Okay. Okay. So specifically, what, how many constructors would you have, and what would their arguments be? Well, let's see. Well, it, I mean, it looks like we only have two private members. Correct. Two private data members. Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. So, what I'm hearing is that we should have a constructor that allows us to set both those attributes, so that when we create it, we could create it with a uh, with with the amount and with the level of service. Also, mention that we could have a no argument constructor, which would um, essentially set those equal to some default values. Probably set cost to zero and set service to maybe zero or maybe average, which was one. You know, so that would be a possibility. Any other constructors? There's, there's two other possible constructors that we could have. All right. We could have one that just set cost. We could have one that just set service. Do either of those make sense? And if so, why? Or why not? Okay. Okay. Okay, that would be the no argument constructor. What I'm asking about specifically now is would it make sense to have a constructor that just set costs or a constructor that just set service? Okay, we have a no vote. No vote. No? What if I were to tell you I could see one of those two making sense but the other one not making sense? Which one do you think I, uh, which one do you think could, uh, uh, which one would you say uh, could maybe make sense and which one would you say, nah, that's definitely a bad idea? Sir. Which one? Sir. Is the one that makes sense or is a bad idea? All of that, sir, makes, would make sense instead of default, sir. Really? Interesting. But a uh, set of default service and so what would your constructor be? Well, your constructor would be the service type and setting the default service. So, uh, I'm confused. Your argument wouldn't be service then if you're setting a default. Right? I'm sorry. No. It would be 
Okay, cost. In other words, we could set the cost and we could assume that the service was just average and, and, and not worry about poor or not worry about excellent. That way, we have our simple tip calculator. We could make a real simple tip calculator that only accepted an amount assume the service was just ordinary run-of-the-mill service and then gave a tip based on that. Okay, so it would make sense to me to have a, uh, a, a constructor for cost that we defaulted the um, uh, service to, to average. It would make a sense to have a constructor for uh, both of them where we could set both of them in one shot. Um, Makes sense to have a constructor that accepted neither of the arguments? Yeah, probably. I don't know. I might not create one, but I could see creating one. Probably the one that I would say is pretty clear, it doesn't make sense, is to uh, have a, a constructor where you could set the, the service and default the price. You know, what's the default price? Yeah, I, you, were, you were thinking backwards. You were thinking default the price, but then you would set the cost, right? So that one I would say didn't wouldn't make sense. Yes. Quick question. Did you say that the way it is right now without right. the right. did not set these values to anything? Because I thought they would be initialized to they would well being a double and an in. Uh, yeah. The constructor doesn't do that. The act of declaring a double and an int is what does that. So yeah, strictly speaking, those do get set. But um, so let's make a, at least let's make a, let's make a couple constructors. All right. Um, what's the syntax to make a constructor? What do I do? I type something in. What do I type in? Public. Public. You don't need to type void. No, yeah, a constructor never returns anything. So you would just type public meal, and you could define the arguments. I'm going to define um, the one that just sets the cost, and we're going to define the one that just sets the service. And not because it's a bad idea, but for no particular reason, I'm not going to define the one uh, with with no um, with, with no arguments. Actually, there is a reason why I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that to demonstrate that in fact you will get a compile error if you if you declare a constructor. Uh, because you no longer get the empty constructor. So let me go in and make double arg cost int arg service. It's funny typing on my own laptop here. And I can say cost equals Arg cost <coughs> service equals arg service. All right. Now I make a constructor that only accepts the cost. And again, it knows that it's funny because I have two functions, or in this case not really functions, but constructors that have the same signature. They're both constructors and they both accept the same arguments. All right. You can have two functions, two methods that have the same name, provided they have different arguments in, in terms of either different number or different types of arguments. So I could have a constructor that accepts two arguments, and then I can have a constructor that accepts one argument. That's okay. But I can't have two constructors that accepts a double and an integer. All right? Now, I could do this. Arg cost, uh, cost equals arg cost. Service equals one, because that's the mi middle level of service. That's the average service. All right? And that'll take my argument and set the cost to it and default the service to, to one. All right, let's go now. Let's try to run this guy.
I, by the end of the semester, I'm definitely going to feel like a mad scientist. I all pulling everything out of my bag, and upstairs I have different stuff, and it's just crazy. This is actually a slightly different tablet. All right. So, let's go and run this guy. And, big surprise, we get an error. Whoops. We get an error. Why do we get an error? The fact that we declared, yeah. Yeah, the fact that we declared a constructor means we don't get the no argument constructor for free. Um, that almost, you know, when, when I first learned that, I remember thinking, it's like, that sounds like, like, a, like a game, you know? Like, oh, you know, well, you declared one, so you don't get the free one, you know? And it's not like that. The, the thought is, is that when you're defining constructors, you're telling the Java compiler, hey, look, I know what I'm doing. I want to handle these constructors. So it says, okay, fine, I won't do anything for you. If you don't declare any constructors, the compiler says, hmm, you've got to be able to make one of these objects, so I'll give this guy a constructor for free. So we would have to use one of these two other constructors. And so what I'll do whoops, is I'll cut this line, put it down here. And then I will call the constructor with these two values. I wasn't paying attention there. I set it equal to the text box. Yeah. And tip is, or level of service is this. So now I can go, and I should be OK. And we are in business. And there's our tip calculator back. We can go in and we can enter an amount and a service. And then calculate the tip, and it calculates the tip correctly. All right, so now that's good and that works, but let's go for some style points, you know, like in ski jumping. It doesn't matter how far, you know, it, it does matter how far you fly, but you, you also get points for doing it with style, all right? Let's, let's, let's add a little style here. How could I write this constructor differently? Right. In other words, instead of duplicating that code to set the cost and get, set the service, I could call the two argument constructor and give the one argument to it and then give the, um, give the default value. What's the syntax to do that? Yeah. So I could do this. Arg cost, comma, one. All right. It's a little bit cleaner code. You're saying, if I call this with two arguments, oh, I'm sorry, one argument, call the two argument constructor and default the other value. All right. 
How can we go for style points here? And why would we want to go for style points here? Hey, that works. We're not ski jumpers. Call the set function. Okay, so. Why would you do that? Well, okay, well, why would you do that? Well, one thing that's great about teaching is if, if people ask you questions, you can actually just like repeat the question and then you're a good teacher. Well, why would you do that? You'll answer that? Good. Yeah. If I were to have some sort of validation uh, and throw exceptions, for example, I could have some sort of validation uh, in the set cost method that made sure that it was a number between a positive number and a number between, you know, up to whatever the most expensive meal is. Right. With me, like four ninety-five. <laughs> yeah, you can assume that, right? Remember. Exactly. Remember, our job is to build components, and we want to build each component we can as solid as it is. Because, and again, that's even with the discussion with the, with the constructors, like what constructors do we need. I was glad that I didn't hear you folks say things like, well, in this case, we have both of them up front, because you're not building just for this case. You're building a component. And again, even though this is a fairly trivial component, the thought is we're building a component that we should be able to plug into other environments. So we might be using it some other way. So again, with that in mind, yeah, you can assume that there's going to be validation all right, to make sure that that works. All right? As such, um, if you call the set function, then your throwing of exceptions you could put in one place and be confident that that works. Um, do I always code it this way myself? No, I probably don't. If there's no validation, if it was just a set name, I probably ne wouldn't necessarily do that. But this probably is like the textbook way to do it. All right. One last thought on this, literally on this, <laughs> all right. this has to be the first line of the constructor. So I can't have some other stuff than this whatever. Um, likewise, and we're not really talking about inheritance at this point, but um, similarly, if I do super, which calls a constructor on the super class, it has to be the first line. Um, by implication, you can't call this and super in the same constructor, right? Because both of them got to be the first line. So you can't have two first lines, so that implication is, is that. So okay, now I think we got some style points on this. All right. Next thing I want to talk about is our exceptions. All right. Because if you noticed, let me try to get this not to time out so quickly so I'm not constantly swiping. Screen time out after 30 seconds. No wonder it keeps time it out. We'll do 30 minutes. There we go. All right. If you remember from last time, if I go in and I run this and I don't put any values in, it blows up. So let's go and run this. Let's go and run this. All right. If I go in here and I do not put anything in there and click calculate tip, you can tell by the fact that that button stays gold for a while that nothing good's going to happen here. All right. And effectively, I didn't see what popped up. Did something saying it died pop up? Okay. Well, yeah, it died. If I recall when I did this on the other one, I got a little message first. But here it just, it just went. All right. 
So what's the problem? The problem, of course, is that somewhere down the line, it expects the cost to be a double. An empty string is not a double. So more than likely, like this line is blowing up. All right, where I'm taking double cost equals double parse double e get text to string blah blah blah. All right. So, what do we do? Well, it's going to benefit for us to wrap um, this code in a try catch block. All right. You all familiar with try catch blocks? All right. But just to review, try. Good. If you're familiar with it, tell me the syntax for it. Catch exception E. All right, there we go. And then what I'm going to do is I will set the text saying invalid input. Whoops. Because really, what else could go wrong? Well, we can talk about that. This is not this is not necessarily the only way to handle that. All right, so now we go and run this. And drum roll, please. All right, go to calculate tip. We get our message saying error in input. Now, the statement was asked, could we put validation in the GUI to do that? And yeah, we could. All right. Really, if you think about it, there are several ways that you can prevent errors from happening. All right. Or, or I won't say prevent errors from happening. There's several ways of dealing with errors. Number one is it's possible through your form design to not allow an error to happen. All right. And again, you know, what would be an example of that? An example of that would be using a checkbox for a Boolean, right? Use a checkbox for a Boolean is either going to be checked or unchecked, right? You know, it has to be. So by your form design, you can, you can limit some errors. If you're connecting and you're, you're writing to a database, um, you could constrain the length of an input field if, if, if the, the thing that you're writing to has a certain length a and so on. You could use a drop down. Uh, instead of letting someone type in something like we're doing here, we're only allowing limited choice. So we can eliminate some errors by designing our, our GUI and designing our form. So those we can get out of the way. Another way to deal with it would be to write validation code. All right. So we could, I could put code in here to say if you know, uh, to, to look at that, look for an empty string or whatever the criteria is, all right, and uh, if it didn't meet the criteria for a valid entry, I could um, display uh, an error message and, and maybe a more descriptive error message or whatever, all right. That's the second way of doing it. You let the error happen, but then you code to catch it before it does any damage. 
The last way to sort of deal with errors is just let it crash, but be there to clean up the mess. All right? And that's effectively what I did in this case. All right? I didn't do any validation. Let's so give it a shot. Run it. It'll tell me if there's an error. Now, you might say, well, it probably would be good design to put the validation in the GUI. And that's true. But, let's say we add more extensive validation in that, uh, in that uh, setting the value. Let's say, for example, we put, uh, we change the, the value, um, the set value to throw an exception if the amount is more than, I don't know, $200. All right? Let's say we were to do that. We probably don't want to change the GUI to add that validation in there. Or let me, let me rephrase that. You could argue that you don't want to put that in the GUI. All right? Because that's the GUI knowing a little bit about the guts of that class. All right? If a legal cost for a meal is somewhere between zero and two hundred dollars, let's say, let's say we've defined that, all right, we wouldn't want to put that validation in the GUI because that means the GUI has to know some, quote, business rules about the meal class. All right? And there's a school of thought that would then say, yeah, maybe you put some very bare bones uh, validation in the GUI, but everything else it's the class's job to tell you that that's valid or invalid. The problem would be if I did put that in the GUI, all right, if I did put, let's say, a validation that the, the meal could only be between zero and two hundred dollars, if all of a sudden I started traveling in, in uh, you know, with some high rollers and my started eating at restaurants where the meal was more than that, I could change the class and the GUI is still going to be an error. A change to something in the environment, a change to the business rule, I'd have to change it in two places. Ah, that's a nightmare, right? You know, the idea is, is anything changes in, in the, the, the environment or in the problem domain, I guess is a better way to put it than environment. If anything changes in the problem domain, I should only have to make that change in one place. So, yeah, validation to make sure an empty string. An empty string is never going to be a legal double. <laughs> all right? So, yeah, that kind of validation, yeah, put in the GUI. All right? Right. 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 Now, in this case, with with the with the control itself, I can only put numbers in or whatever. So, that that helps some of the problem, but again, not not necessarily all of it. It would make it harder too, yeah. Well, the, the GUI would, again, have to have business rules in it. The, the GUI would have to then, like, convert dollars to business rules and, and whatever. So, yeah. So, yeah, that, that's another reason uh, for that. So, again, um, the three sort of approaches you can take to error catching, uh, the one being... Um, Design your form so that you can have an error, all right, or to as great a degree as possible. The other approach is to put some validation in the GUI that, okay, you'll let them do something that's wrong, but you'll catch it before any damage. And then the last one is simply let it go and catch any exceptions you have. And that, that almost sounds like the lazy way, all right, but you can make an argument for that being theoretically the best way to do it. Again, for all the reasons about the... the the business rule that does the validation of that, and so on and so forth. All right. Now, if you've noticed, um, what I want to do, again, the purpose of this week was to uh, refresh our memory on Java. It turns out that you folks have a pretty decent memory on Java. So we, weren't, we didn't need to do that maybe to as, as great a degree as I thought I did. So uh, what I've done is I've added some GUI elements to this uh, and we're going to expand 
the Java class. So we'll get a little bit of practice with doing some Java stuff, but we will also get some practice uh, coding in the Android environment. And what I did is I added to the GUI, you can see it here, a checkbox to whether it is to go or not. All right. So there's a third attribute for the meal. All right. There's there's the, the amount of the meal, there's the, the level of service, and whether it's to go or not. All right. Um, I then, you can see by the extra space between the, the label that's there and the button, I've put a, a, uh, I've put a label in for the tax. I've put in a label for the, uh, well, we have a label for the tip. I have a label for the tax, and then I have a label for the total, when the total being the amount plus the, uh, plus the tip plus the tax. All right. So what I like to do is I like to finish the coding of this piece of it, all right? Um, and that will involve a little bit of Java stuff and a little bit of uh, coding in the, in, in the Android uh, side of things. All right. So where do we start? What's our starting point on this? Yeah, you should have an idea of what we already have. I already added the GUI, yeah. I added them to the GUI simply because I wasn't sure what the resolution of this would be. But, um, oops. The way it was displaying my page before, I was having trouble seeing some of these other fields. All right, so I thought I'll just add the GUI. Um, I actually didn't even use the graphical view to do this. I just went in and, and did the coding uh, for it. Um, sometimes I mess up when you drag it. And if you're dragging things around, if you're rearranging things, sometimes you might be rearranging them in a way you don't realize it. So a lot of times, you know, if you actually cut the code and paste it, um, that's a better way. So we have the GUI set. So that we don't have to worry about. What's the next thing that we should address? Okay, so what do we need to add to the meal class? Okay, now is that a field or is that going to be a, a function? The tax? To, to calculate the tax on the meal. No, the user won't enter it. It will be calculated. The way it will be calculated will be, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, on to-go goods, there's no tax, but on uh, dine-in, there is whatever the sales tax is. All right. I'll, I'll hard code the percentage, and again, I could make that a, a, a public staff, a final, a constant. But what attribute do we need to add here? They want to have a different approach. Well, the cost is a, is a total of the meal. In other words, if it's ten dollars for all you can eat pancakes, ten dollars. The total then the, the total would be the ten dollars plus if I dined in, whatever the tax is on that, plus if I left a two dollar tip. Okay. Okay. Ben, do you have any thoughts? I think I can see wheels turning, so I'm assuming you have some thoughts. Maybe your thought is that you can't wait to for the weekend, but there's something going on. <laughs> okay. We, okay. Okay. For this, for the purpose of this, we want to show on the 
we want to show on the screen the tip, the tax, and the total. So we have the amount we want to take and add the tax, the tip, and the total. But that's not really the question. That's what we want to display on the screen. The question that is on the floor now is what attributes do we want to add to this? Now again, we could add an amount. Well, let me ask you this. Do we have an attribute for the tip? No, we don't. Why don't we? Because it can be calculated from the other attributes. So, so could the total, so could the tax. So, you could do this a bunch of different ways. The way I would do this is, I would just add a private Boolean for to go. Yeah. And um, I'll add it to this constructor. And I'll assume that we're dining in, so I'll put false. And I'll put my set and get. All right. Now, when I design my class, I am not going to create an attribute for um, the tax and for the um, total. I'm going to make that available through methods. All right. And the reason for that is it simplifies things. Right. Think if we did have an attribute for um, the total, all right, and for the tax. If we went and changed the to go from carry out to to go, we'd have to go and not just change that attribute, but we'd have to do a recalculation to keep everything in sync, all right? To go is the same thing as carry out. To go to dine in. <laughs> All right. Yeah, if we change that Boolean from true to false, or false to true, we'd also have to go and recalculate the total and the tax. All right. And that seems messy to me just to set an attribute. All right. Um, essentially, anytime you set any attribute, you'd have to go and recalculate if you were doing that. And I would just as soon make that available as through a method. The, that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a get. In this example. But again, think about the state of this class once we write this component and set it out in the world. All right? If you go in and set those properties, if you had a property that showed the tip amount, the total, and the tax, then anytime you set any of those properties, you have to recalculate all of them. All right. Um, I would say, I would argue, it's better to set those properties and just set those properties. When you want to know the amount, then you go and ask for the calculation to be performed. All right. Um, Slightly different way of doing it. I guess I wouldn't are you know. I guess I wouldn't complain too hard. This just seems simpler to me. No, no, I'm just saying every time you click the checkbox. 
Yeah. You're going to recalculate. No, only when I click the, the button to calculate. I'm going to do that. Right. All right. So I'm going to make my calculate tax and calculate total methods. Repeat, please. <laughs> and what's the rule again? If to go is true, so if to go equals equals false, remember to use a double equal sign. You could probably do something fancy like doing exclamation point to go, but I never remember that syntax. So I'll say equals false. If it's false, then tax. Yeah, yeah. Tax equals amount times, not amount, but cost, times, what's the rate of sales tax? Right. We'll make up a number. Six, six two, five sounds good to me. And then we'll return tax. What's the calc total going to be? Right. Total equals cost plus calc tip plus Calc tax. All right? You can put the this pronoun in front of it. Uh, my philosophy on that is is whatever like rings a bell with you. You know, a lot of times, just to see the function sometimes can be confusing. If you see this, it's like, oh, okay, now I know where that function's from. But if you omit it, it's no big deal. All right. Touche. Yep. Touche. Right. Well, but you would then have, well, are we wasting processing? Because you're going to have to call that every time something changes. So you set the amount, you're going to have to call calc tax. You set the uh, to go, you're going to have to call calc tax. In this example. All right. Right. <laughs> With the way that we have this, we're only we're only calling the functions when we hit the uh, when we when we hit the amount. All right. Um, the statement was if we had an attribute for tax, an attribute for tip, and an attribute for total. If we had that then, then any time you set anything, you'd have to call and do some calculations. Here, I'm not doing any calculations until they ask that they want some calculations performed. Yes. So we're going to call calc tax twice. Right. Or your class would be out of sync. It would say that you had great service on a hundred dollar thing and the tip was incorrect. All right. All right. So now what we're going to do is we are going to go and how do we grab the value of 
How do we grab the value of that um, checkbox? It's going to look like this, right? So, probably say checkbox C equals cast as a checkbox. Find view by ID, R ID. Okay, maybe checkbox. Oh. Um, where do we get that ID from? Well, we have to look at the at the layout. And in the layout, the checkbox is called this. ID to go. So I'll have to go here and say ID to go. Now, we got a little squiggly line, right? So something ain't right. Is that control called a checkbox? Yeah, it's called a checkbox. At least it looks like it's called a checkbox. What do you suppose is wrong? Mm, no. That sometimes is the case, but not the case this time. Well, you know what? Let's click on this. There's a little light bulb. The little light bulb over there means it has an idea how to fix it. The, yeah, very, very hard to see, like right next to the X. All right? And it's telling us a checkbox can't be resolved as a type. It doesn't know what checkbox is. Okay. That's one, well, let, let's back up. That's one possibility is I got the name wrong. All right? I, I said checkbox. We could Google it and we could find out, yeah, it's a checkbox. All right? Well, I'll save the trouble there. I could have spelled it wrong. I could have spelled C-H-E-K, you know, forgot the C or whatever. The other possibility is, as we click on that, I need to import the checkbox package, or, or, or rather the checkbox class. And if you just then click on that, it goes and imports it. Now, the importing, if you notice, the import, import stuff is up at the top and you can click on it and you can expand it and you can see all the stuff that's imported or you can also hide it if you want. Yeah. Yeah, it just goes right where it is and all that. Yeah. So pay attention to the little um, light bulb. because. you lose anything by saying import? No. Might make your compiles a little longer, but it should not affect runtime. All right. No. Yeah. So it might make your compiles a little longer because that's the look uh, than doing that. All right. So now, no. It, it, it just tells it where to find things. Yeah. Remember, your choice is either to type or import. All right. If you have a class, you could either give the full package path to it, or you could import it at the top and then then be done with it. All right. So. Now, C dot, and thank goodness for IntelliSense, we can look through here and I think it's is checked. There we go. Is checked. Now notice, and this is a little hard to see maybe, um, if you pull up something via the Java docs, remember that a class can get its methods from, can either be declared on that class or on one of the ancestors. This is telling you that this method actually comes from the ancestor of the checkbox, which, which is the compound button. So like if we were to Google that, yeah, exactly. So if we were to Google this, yes, 
if we were going to Google this, well, you'll just have to take my word for it. It would show, you'd have to, you'd have to go and expand it um, to see. You'd have to expand it. That threw me off the other day when I was looking for a method on one of these. It's like, I think it was actually this very one. It's like, there has to be in his check method on a checkbox. Come on, you know. And I looked through all the methods for checkbox and it wasn't there. Well, you have to look for the methods that it gets from his ancestors. All right, so I should be able to go is checked. All right. And I can calculate. the tip and set the answer to that. I could do something similar for tax in total. Yeah. And I think I think I call them tax in total. I'll go and look at the layout to verify that. Tip, tax in total. All right. Then And what did I call my methods? Calc tax, M calc total, and tax total. We will let it rip. And we go in and let's say that we have average service, $100 check, and it's not to go. So it should be 100 15% tip, so it would be $15 tip, tax should be six twenty-five, dollars and total would be whatever the sum of that is, $121.25. All right, and there we go. Yay. All right. Now, um, the, the big, uh, the main purpose of, of, of the classes this week were to be uh, refreshers for Java, and we got through that pretty well. All right, so we were able to actually go beyond what I, I thought we were going to cover and, and go into the Android. Now, to be sure, there's a lot of stuff about this we're, we're going to need to know, all right, to, going forward. I guess to summarize kind of the most important stuff from the Android end of it, forgetting about the, just the Java stuff, is layout being in this XML file, all right? The IDs are defined this way. Any text that you have are defined in this strings file. That helps you, string XML file, that helps you achieve a degree of consistency and also gives the potential for localization because you can point to a different language file if you need to uh, for that. All right. So that works with that. This actually, the, the IDs actually get created in this little R file which actually helps do the glue and help to connect the controls that are in your GUI and your layout with the code. All right. 
So, strings file for like string constants, for constants. <laughs> Main file for the layout. That R file gets generated. We then have our activity. And if we look at this activity, sort of the key points here are for any button, we need to create a listener. If, if that's how we're going to do this, if we're going to do it with a, with a button, we create a listener. And then we use the find view by ID to find things based on their ID, get a pointer to them. We have to cast it to make it the right type so that we can treat it like the proper type that it is. All right. And then we're on our way. We're, we're doing basic Java programming, you know. We, you know, we, we may have to struggle a little bit to find a particular property for method for a particular control, uh, but we can create our own classes and, and call methods on them and, and go from there. All right. So the big thing I think, you know, when, whenever you're studying uh, this stuff is how the components fit together. So that's really, I think, the, the lesson I wanted to get you uh, from that. One last thing I want to point out, uh, and we'll, we'll pick up on this week. In a way, I'm going I'm to look at, because what we're going to cover, la uh, what I was planning on covering next week, I think is actually like a step down from what we did in class this week. So I'm going to have to make that tougher. All right. Uh, the one thing I did want to point out is notice that you actually have three different folders. All right. High, low, and medium. And you can put versions of images in there to display depending on the screen size. For example, here's an icon. And let's, let's actually go to, um, actually go to, um, let's actually go to the file system and look at, at uh, those. All right, there's three folders, high, low, and medium. Here's the icon on a high screen resolution. Here's the icon on a medium screen resolution. Notice it's a little bit smaller. And then finally on a low screen resolution, where'd it go? It's a little smaller still. All right. That's one, one way that you can handle the fact that you're writing an application that might work on a big old tablet or it might work on a little bitty phone. Or it might work on one of these guys. It's kind of halfway in between. So you can put different versions of the images here or in this case the different icons for the application. And that way it gives the, you know, on, on, you know, on, a, on a tiny phone this big old uh, icon, you know, it would cover up a quarter of the phone probably. So you'd want, you want to have the ability to uh, choose the icon based on that. But you could do that for other images as well. You know, if you, had, if you know someone has a tablet and they have the real estate, you can display higher res pictures than if they have a tiny, tiny little phone. All right, so I did want to mention that this time. We'll certainly explore more of this um, next time. Any questions? Okay. Do you want to talk about them now, or, or do you want to? Um, I, I'm not terribly picky about that. Um, the, 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 what he's referring to is a package structure. Um, typically with a package structure, um, it, it's really used for identifying so that you don't, uh, it gives a namespace so that you don't run into a conflict. Your rock, paper, scissors with, um, you know, 
someone else's rock, paper, scissors, a store that actually sells rock, papers, and scissors, all right, or something like that. You can get at Office Depot, for example. Um, so I'm not terribly picky about that. It probably would be good that it would start edu.lorainccc. I think in my examples, the package that I've used is CISS 368, or I'm sorry, 268. But, um, which, is, which is actually not this class. This class is 265. <laughs> but uh, you get the idea. Uh, no, not necessarily. Yeah. Yes. No, it doesn't matter. No, that's fine. I'm not sure why I said that. Probably one of my test devices ran on 7. All right. Yeah. The, the example prior to, the, the, the starting point for this was made available, all right, before. Uh, but now that I'm, we made these revisions to it, I'll make this. There's a folder called Lectures and Examples. And, and uh, there's the videos for the lectures, and the example files usually are like right next to the, to the lecture. So, yeah. And then, is that, like, your videos are also Yes. So where would we find them again on YouTube? Um, the easiest way to do it would be to, um, if, you, if you pull up one of my videos, um, if you click the lo YouTube logo, that opens up the video in YouTube. And then you can see the user. My user is actually like Prof M. Zellers, I believe. P R O F M. Zellers. And that, that'll. And the last question I had was hmm? uh, okay, you take the app, project, it's How did you create the. Oh, how did I create that? You just go in under File, New. Well, that's part of the challenge. <laughs> Expect me to answer, you know, spoon feed it to you? No. You go to File, New, Class. Yeah. You put the package in there. You say where you want to put it. Typically, you're going to we'll put it in the application source directory. You give the package name for it, you give that, and go from there. You probably can. Um, you, you shouldn't need to because it, will, it gives you the main, when you create a new application, it gives you the main and the strings file for free. So you can, you can, you can just, uh, you know, just manipulate those. Other questions? All right. One thing I will do, um, so two of you have devices. I was going to say, uh, maybe I'll bring a device. Well, I always have at least one device that we can, we can test it on to make sure it works in that environment, even though two of you do have devices. All right. Yeah, the only input will be, yeah, essentially you'll have um, a spinner with rock, paper, scissors in it, a button that says go and play. Actually, you, you, you probably could write this so that when you clicked on that, it fired off that, but you don't need to worry about that. Just have a button. I think that simplifies it. Um, and then you'll, you know, when you click that, you'll need to create a class. Call that class with what your choice was. Let it randomly make a choice, and then implement the rules uh, to determine who wins. Then it should say it should say what the what the computer threw: rock, paper, scissors, and um, whether you won or lost. Right. Yeah, I suppose you could, but. 
Oh, yeah. Right. In other, in other words, yeah, in other words, when you clicked the button, it took your choice and would generate the computer's choice and show you. Yeah, yeah that would work. Yeah, you could do that as well. Yeah, and that, yeah, there you go. Yeah, in fact, I'm going to change the assignment to no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. You could you could do all kinds of things. I was I was thinking either I was thinking even, and it probably wouldn't take much to like add images to your choice and, and that. But again, we just want to make sure we know how things talk to each other. In 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 modern software development, that's a huge thing. <laughs> all right, understanding how things talk to each other because you're done with the giant stack of of uh, a punch card COBOL programs where like everything lived in that program and you popped it in there and, and you ran, you know. You're, you're now in the mode where you have these little components that do things and there's nice and there's a lot of uh, um, advantages to that and there's a lot of reasons for doing that, but you have to make sure they're talking to each other and, and doing it well. So that, that's, that's where the challenge comes. Questions? All right. No, it's just a plain Mac, uh, MacBook. It's not a MacBook Pro. It's, it's old. It, it, I was thinking the other day when I got this. I, I think I got this like in 2006. Well, this is like, it's like six years old. So yeah, they, they had, actually had them in, they had a version that was in, in white and black. They had a white version and a black version. Yeah. Yeah. Is what? Uh, the battery still working on it? The battery, I don't think, works ever. <laughs> I've always plugged it in. I was going to say, did you 